call the ornithopter. Uh, this device, uh, I expect to attain flight in the air. Through a system of leverage advantage, plus a man's physical power, I believe it's possible to fly as a bird. <coughs> Although flying had been in existence for some time, it wasn't until April Fool's Day in 1918 that the Royal Air Force was finally born. In 1911, France had over 200 aircraft and 263 aviators. Germany had a fleet of 30 airships, while Britain boasted three airships, between four and eight aircraft and a staggering 19 competent aviators. Something had to be done. A parliamentary committee was set up which produced a white paper in 1912 which set up a unified flying service called the Flying Corps. But His Majesty the King decided that as flying, let alone fighting in the air, was a hazardous occupation, he would issue a royal warrant to grant it the title of the Royal Flying Corps. This Royal Flying Corps was to have a central flying school, a military wing to work with the army, a naval wing to work with the navy, a reserve, and the Royal Aircraft Factory at Farnborough to build its military aircraft. The first important product from the Royal Aircraft Factory for the new Royal Flying Corps was the BE-2 biplane designed by Geoffrey de Havilland. Both the Army and the Navy had their own views on the Royal Flying Corps. The Admiralty had no intention of playing the game and insisted on having its own aviators and ordered its aircraft direct from the manufacturers. So it was inevitable that Farnborough concentrated its efforts on producing aircraft for the Army rather than what was to be called the Royal Naval Air Service. In the 18 months or so before the horrors of the First World War, the Royal Flying Corps was finally wedded to the Army. With most of its bases around Salisbury Plain, where its first squadron formed and trained using a variety of aircraft from both Britain and France. The Navy had been traditionally responsible for the safety of Britain's shores, so it was therefore decreed that the aerial defence of the United Kingdom should be given to the Royal Naval Air Service. So it set up a chain of naval air stations around the coastline for both airships and aircraft. The Royal Naval Air Service then concentrated on developing any method of getting aircraft to take off and land on water. Even before the first war had broken out, small bombs and even torpedoes had been successfully dropped from naval aircraft. When war was declared, the less flamboyant Royal Flying Corps went to France with the British Expeditionary Force with seven squadrons. On the 19th of August, 1914, the RFC began its war with two reconnaissance sorties over the German front line. Reconnaissance was to prove invaluable to the army in the next few months by keeping the troops posted on the latest strength, location, and movements of the enemy. Aircraft were also used to great effect by transferring orders quickly along the British front lines. Within a month, the RFC had started to use both photography and wireless telegraphy operationally. By 1915, the war changed from the joy of sitting in the air and watching things unfold on the ground to more hostile activities. Two pilots had spoiled the whole thing by taking revolvers up with them and making pot shots at the enemy aircraft. By October, the French had already armed a voisin with a machine gun and shot down a German aircraft. From that moment on, war in the air had a different meaning.
As early as March 1915, the assault on Neuve Chapelle benefited because of tactical maps based solely on aerial photographs. Up till then, the RFC had simply been observers, but in the same month, aircraft were bombed up and sent in to attack behind the enemy lines to prevent the Germans moving their reserves up to the front. By now, more and more casualties were mounting in the war in the air. As 1915 moved on, Germany produced a fighter far in advance of anything that the British had. It was the Fokker monoplane, which was the first aircraft to solve the problem of firing a machine gun through the propeller arc. British scouts were soon known as Fokker fodder, as they were no match for the Eindecker. Probably one of the most significant effects of the war was the appointment of Colonel Hugh Trenchard to take over the RFC in France on August the 19th, 1915. 1915 also saw the RFC spreading its wings to the Middle East. By 1916, Trenchard's battles were coming to fruition, with the FE-2, which had a gunner in the nose who could rake the sky both in front and up in the air. 1916 was also the year of the greatest land battle to date, the Battle of the Somme, where aircraft started flying contact patrols at low level and literally directing the troops from the air. But by September that year, Germany started the first of its large fighter circuses, which decimated the crews of the RFC. At home during 1915, German Zeppelins had roamed the countryside almost unopposed. But by September 1916, using a combination of artillery and aircraft, the RFC started to redress the balance. In France, Trenchard's problem was still outdated aircraft manufactured at Farnborough. But the Royal Naval Air Service had already ordered two new aircraft from the Sopwith Company, the Strutter and the Sopwith Puff. In the meantime, the Navy had been fighting an offensive war. It developed the torpedo bomber. It perfected a method of launching its aircraft from the turrets of its big guns. And it had even experimented with deck landings. Another product of the Navy's foresight was the heavy bomber. Back in 1914, the Navy had approached Frederick Handy Page with the idea of building a very large heavy bomber. This became the Handy Page 0100, which entered service with the RNAS in April 1917. This was then further developed into the 0400. These heavyweights were used by both the Navy and the RFC later that year. Over in the UK, the Germans had improved their bombing techniques by augmenting their Zeppelins with huge Gotha bombers. But they had little effect as the RFC had been forced to form home defense squadrons made up of some of the trainers of the day. Because of the carnage and the huge loss of life in Europe, the fairer sex were mobilized to help in the war effort back in Britain. They did everything from rigging airships to covering and doping wings and handling the new aircraft ready for dispatch to France. But life wasn't all work and no play. The British public was becoming restless with the performance of its air forces and the political infighting between the Army, the Navy, and the RFC. It was time for a change, and the man chosen for that task was South African General Jan Smuts, who proposed the amalgamation of the RFC and the RNAS. 1917 was the age of the fighter aces in France. High scorers like Albert Ball, Bishop from Canada, McCudden, who became the hero of the British press, and Manock, who became the tactical ace of aerial warfare. Their opposition were the formidable German flying circuses, led by the ace of aces, Baron von Richthofen, the Red Baron, Udet, and Hermann Goering, who was destined to become the chief of the Luftwaffe in World War II. And so the carnage continued on the Western Front, with one third of the RFC being wiped out in just one month. It was on the 1st of April, 1918, 
that General Smuts got his wish. From that day, the RFC and the RNAS ceased to exist, both becoming integral parts of the new Air Force, which King George V decreed would be known as the Royal Air Force, and Trenchard became its chief of staff. By this time, the Western Front had erupted into violent and dangerous action. Both sides were exhausted, getting nowhere, and the priority was for new pilots. After a short training at home, they would arrive at the local railway station, throw their meager belongings onto a truck, before reporting at the airfield for duty. Even on the front line, there was a certain amount of square bashing, before the most important part of the job, gunnery practice. After a few days, it was a posting to a squadron. The new pilot would either live in a Nissan hut or even a camouflage tent. The boss might have somewhere a little more salubrious. Then it was time to fly, test the engine, test the controls. And with the stomach churning in rhythm to the engine, squadron takeoff. then into battle against the German circus. In the first six months of the new Royal Air Force, it lost a staggering 600 aircraft. Day after day, Richthofen and his men climbed into their flimsy craft to harass and kill the RAF pilots. After the battle, the aircraft returned to base, what was left of them. Then you had to report to the intelligence officer. How many kills did you get? While the pilots went into the officer's mess for a well-earned drink, the mechanics had to examine the damage to their prized aircraft and try to put them back together to fight another day. At least today, it hadn't all been one-sided. One enemy aircraft captured, Fokker lay in ruins, and this was all that was left of the German bomber. At the end of World War I, a defeated Germany was in a sorry state with little to look forward to in its future. Politically devastated, its military machine in ruins, and the German people demoralized, worse was yet to come. Under the Treaty of Versailles, the German Wehrmacht was restricted to 100,000 men. The Prussian commanders interpreted this to mean 100,000 officers. So a large clandestine army began to grow, and the weapons to go with it. But Germany's so-called democracy found it impossible to rejuvenate its ailing economy. When the war finally ended on the 11th of November 1918, the world's armament industry ground to a halt almost overnight. The Royal Air Force was also painfully aware that it couldn't progress without public support in peacetime. Aerial spectacular, such as the first fixed-wing Atlantic crossing by Alcock and Brown in the British Vimy in 1919, were encouraged by both the manufacturers and the military for their publicity value. Trenchard saw that a Royal Air Force had to have its own traditions and its own training facilities. On the 5th of February 1920, Winston Churchill opened the RAF College at Cranwell in Lincolnshire. With peace in Europe, Trenchard said that the first duty of the RAF was to garrison the British Empire. So it was in India, Mesopotamia, 
and all points east and south that independent air power began to show its potential. Trouble brewed in Iraq, where Great Britain had been given a mandate to develop a new state. From March 1921, the Royal Air Force had to take over control from the army. It also had to create a regular transport service between Egypt and Baghdad across 800 miles of desert with no navigational aids at all. So the RAF plowed a track right across the desert with fuel installations all along the route. At home, Trenchard's Short Service Commission scheme came into being in 1924. It was at this time, too, that the official fleet air arm of the Royal Air Force was formed. The whole organization was based at Lucas in Scotland and Gosport in the south of England. Trenchard followed this up with a new look at the home defense lineup, which was now called Air Defense of Great Britain. Special reserve squadrons were formed, comprising one third of regulars and two thirds local volunteers. This auxiliary air force was based at military airfields near to adjoining towns in order to find the volunteers. There were some 16 squadrons in all. In 1925, another of Trenchard's bright ideas came to fruition with the formation of the university air squadrons to attract undergraduates into the service as a long-term career. Up until the mid-20s, the aircraft was still very much ex-World War I. But by 1926, Westlands had been ordered to design a new aeroplane to use up surplus DH-9A wings. The end product was the Wapiti, which served well in both Iraq and India right up until the start of World War II. This period in the RAF was the era of record-breaking flights. For instance, the Supermarine Southampton entered service at Callshot in September 1925. The Southampton will always be remembered for the Far East flight, which began at Felixstowe in 1927, when four metal-hulled Southamptons were fitted out to fly to Singapore. They left Plymouth on the 17th of October, 1927, flying over Europe to Egypt, then across the desert to Baghdad, and on to India and down to Selatar, which was to be the flight's permanent base. The Schneider Trophy race had begun in a small way in 1913 at Monaco. Jack Schneider's trophy was put up to encourage the development of marine aircraft. It was a speed race, and the outright winner would be the nation which won three consecutive times. R.J. Mitchell of Supermarine designed a succession of winners in 1927, 1929, culminating in the outright win in 1931 with his S-6B flown by Flight Lieutenant Boothman at 340.8 miles an hour. Mitchell was to use this aircraft as a basis for his highly successful Spitfire later in the decade. With the beginning of the 30s, two new sinister developments came into the open. First was the rising star of totalitarianism in Italy, Mussolini, who thanked Germany for helping him in his brutal Abyssinian campaign. And the other was Germany's Adolf Hitler, who in flagrant violation of the Treaty of Versailles was building a huge army and was determined to build an air force at least equal to that of France. 1935 was a turning point for the Royal Air Force and its expansion, as that may be considered as the setting of the sun on the RAF of a peacetime era. On July the 6th, His Majesty King George V held a silver jubilee review of his Royal Air Force at RAF Mildenhall. 350 aircraft from some 40 squadrons were on show at Mildenhall, where His Majesty drove around the five miles of aircraft before being driven off to RAF Duxford to watch the flypasts of Hawker Hearts, Handley Page Hayfords, one of the last biplane bombers, and then some splendid aerobatic displays, and a mass parachute drop on the airfield.
This was followed by a crazy flying display by the Avro Tutor, which turned out to be a lot more crazy than most. Seaplanes were visible with the short Rangoon, and the show finished with Hawker Hines. 1935 also saw a number of prototypes take to the air. A ponderous single-engine monoplane, the Vickers Wellesley, which used a new geodetic type of construction designed by Barnes Wallace. He used the same construction for his infamous Wellington bomber later. On the 6th of November, the prototype Hawker Hurricane first flew, and the Air Ministry put in its order for the last biplane fighter, the Gloucester Gladiator. After the First War, the Treaty of Versailles dictated that Germany was not allowed to manufacture planes of war. But with the rise of Adolf Hitler by the middle of the 30s, transport aircraft were soon being converted for military use and quite openly. The rise of the Nazi party had instilled a new sense of nationalism in the German people. Hitler's ultimate goal was to the east and Russia, so that by 1934 his aircraft designers had been asked to build transport aircraft with a bomber potential. Heinkel, for instance, produced the HE-111 as a high-speed transport, but it could and was easily converted into a very effective bomber. At about the same time, the British Air Ministry was looking at a new method of detecting aircraft. It was the invention of a Scot, Robert Watson Watt. He showed on a cathode ray tube how to bounce a radio beam onto an aircraft and get it back again. The time it took gave you the range of the aeroplane. It was called radar. In 1936, Spanish General Francisco Franco and his fascist supporters moved into Spain and started a civil war that was to last three years. Hitler's Condor Legion aided Franco. This was to be a testing ground for his new Luftwaffe. Italy's dictator Mussolini also gave his support to Franco, who was to turn Spain into a fascist state. By 1937, the expansion of the RAF was fully underway with deliveries of the Gladiator and the Bristol Blenheim. The first aircraft to arrive actually turned upside down on landing. So new was a retractable undercarriage. At the end of the year, the first Hurricanes arrived at Norfolk followed six months later by the supermarine Spitfire, in August 1938, Europe marched to the brink of war over Czechoslovakia. The British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, flew to Munich in September, where he proved to be no match for Hitler. But Chamberlain came away convinced that he had brought off war for decades ahead. But in the middle of 1939, Russia and Germany signed a non-aggression pact. War would be in the West. Britain's medium bombers, like the Whitley, were no match for the German equivalents. But the Vickers Wellington was just coming off the production lines. By September 1939, there were some 20 radar or RDF stations set up around the British coastline. They were able to detect aircraft at medium heights of up to 100 miles away. In June 1939, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force was formed to take over many of the routine duties performed by the men. When Germany invaded Poland, both Britain and France were obliged to declare war on Germany. The first British retaliation was on German ships. It had limited success. With Poland conquered, the Luftwaffe turned west and blitzed its way through Norway, Holland and Belgium. But the winter of 1939-1940 was particularly hard with fog and frost, which restricted any air activity over the whole of Northern Europe. The RAF was confined to local air training and a feeling of lethargy soon developed. This became known as the Phony War. At the start of the conflict, the French had 2,745 aircraft, the RAF had 1,911. But Germany boasted 4,093 aircraft mostly flown by experienced pilots, many of whom had already fought in the Spanish Civil War. Back in Britain, the man given the responsibility of Britain's air defences was Air Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding, the Commander-in-Chief of Fighter Command. He was being asked to send more fighters over the Channel while Hitler marched through France and the Low Countries. On May the 26th, 1940, the British forces were evacuated back to England. Operation Dynamo was simply known as Dunkirk. Hitler mistakenly halted his panzer divisions, 
and gave the expeditionary forces time to escape while the RAF took on the Luftwaffe in the skies above. 860 ships of all sizes managed to evacuate 338,000 men. The Luftwaffe lost over 130 planes, the RAF lost 100. On June the 18th, new Prime Minister Churchill told a waiting world. The Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Hitler now planned Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of Britain. The Luftwaffe had amassed three great Luftflotten, with a total of about three and a half thousand aircraft. Against this, Dowding's fighter command was only about 800 strong, but trained pilots from 13 countries joined the RAF to repel Germany's enormous force. Dowding was also in charge of barrage balloons and anti-aircraft command. He also had use of the Observer Corps, who reported any sightings of incoming aircraft to the Ops Room at Bentley Priory in Stanmore. Here, their information was combined with the radar plots and then given to the fighter controllers, who could then scramble their squadrons as they were needed. It was on August the 12th that the real battle began. This was the day before Eagle Day. The full force of the Luftwaffe honed in on Britain's radar stations and all its southern airfields. Eleven Group took the full force of the Luftwaffe's onslaught with 13 squadrons of Hurricanes, six squadrons of Spitfires and two of Blennies. The Luftwaffe was about to get its nose bloody in spite of its daunting numbers. 36 Luftwaffe aircraft were shot down while the RAF lost 22. But the Luftwaffe were convinced that they had knocked out six of Britain's major radar stations. All but one were in operation the next day. Hitler had been assured by his air chief, Hermann Goering, that the RAF would be wiped out in a matter of weeks. But the Luftwaffe's weakness was a lack of fighter support for its bombers. So, as the battle progressed, even the huge German air armadas suffered terrible losses. The worst day was August the 15th, which the Luftwaffe referred to as Black Thursday. Goering changed his tactics. Aeroplane factories and airfields were to be his only targets. Kenwick, Bingen Hill, Hornchurch, North Wales, Debden. Will you warn your controller that this looks like yet another attack on airfields? For six days, all the major southern England airfields suffered continuous attack. But on September the 7th, the Luftwaffe ignored the airfields and set their sights on London. The RAF was somewhat confused at this sudden change of tactics, but it appeared later that the bombing of London was in retaliation from some of Bomber Command's night raids on Berlin in the last week of August. For Hitler, this was a major error as it became the turning point in the battle. The 15th of September was the climax of the Battle of Britain with the biggest raids on London. 56 German aircraft were shot down. It was also on that day that Hitler decided to postpone Operation Sea Lion indefinitely. London continued to be blitzed with little military significance, and the Battle of Britain officially ended on October the 1st. The RAF got the praise it deserved when the Prime Minister uttered his immortal words. Never in the field of human conflict went so much owed by so many to so few. The German raiders still came by night, guided by a new radio device, ex Gerat codenamed Nickvine or Crooked Beam, which was a radio beam directed at the target along which the pathfinders flew until they reached other intersecting beams, which showed them the approach to the bomb release point. This is how the Luftwaffe found and devastated Coventry on the 14th of November. The 
British managed to bend the radio beams, and by 1941, the first airborne radar was fitted to Bowfighter night fighters, Blenheims, and it was later fitted to the defiance of 141 Squadron led by Wing Commander Ted Wolf. On June the 22nd, 1941, one of the biggest slaughters in the history of warfare began. Germany declared war on its ally, the Soviet Union. Operation Barbarossa was supposed to overrun Russia in a matter of weeks. Russia's territory was ominously close to the Romanian oil fields, which supported much of the Luftwaffe, and Hitler had an abiding hatred of communism. At first, Germany looked unstoppable as its huge military machine marched towards Moscow. Churchill at once pledged support to the Red Air Force with the promise of all aircraft that could be spared. The first of 2,952 aircraft to be supplied to the Soviet Union were two Hurricane squadrons under the command of Wing Commander Ramsbottom Isherwood. Back in Northern Europe, the British saw the first of a new breed of German fighter, the Focke-Wulf 190, which had more than an edge on Fighter Command Spitfire 5. Although the Luftwaffe was depleted in northern France because of its campaigns in North Africa and Russia, JD-26 was commanded by the brilliant Oberleutnant Adolf Galland, who was equipped with the equally brilliant 190s. During the winter of 1941, the balance of air superiority swung firmly in favor of the Luftwaffe again. By the spring of 1941, German U-boats, or submarines, had started hunting Allied shipping in the Atlantic in wolf packs with devastating effect. Atlantic convoys were the supply lifeline from the United States to Britain and the rest of Allied Europe. German bombers, motor torpedo boats, and submarines posed a continual threat of Britain's eventual starvation. It was the turn of the RAF's coastal command to redress the balance get the vital convoys through in the Battle of the Atlantic. In the middle of 1940, Coastal Command had only 34 Sunderlands, which were the only aircraft able to operate more than 500 miles from Britain's coastline. But new weapons were introduced later that year. Air-dropped depth charges, and night-flying Hudsons were being fitted with early versions of the air-to-surface vessel radar or ASV, which could detect a fully surfaced U-boat at a range of about three miles. ASV at least discouraged U-boat captains from shadowing convoys on the surface at night. During early 1941, in March and April, 1,176,000 tons of Allied shipping was sunk. So Blenheims from Bomber Command were transferred to Coastal Command to take over short-range duties from the Hudsons, which had a shorter range. Even in 1942, with the United States joining in the war, there was still a gap of some 2,000 miles in the middle of the Atlantic, which couldn't be covered by Coastal Command until the introduction of the Liberator, which had an operational range of 2,400 miles. But Coastal Command only had five of them in August 1942. By the end of the Blitz in May 1941, Bomber Command was embarked on a night offensive over Europe which was to last till the end of the war. Bomber crews in general found it difficult to navigate at night with any precision at all, but a rudimentary radio aid called G had been used by Wellingtons during a raid on Munchen Gladbach on the 11th of August. More significant was the first appearance of Bomber Command's most devastating weapon, the Avro Lancaster Bomber. Three of them were delivered to RAF Waddington on Christmas Eve, 1941. Lancaster comes of a famous family. Its immediate predecessor was the twin-engined Manchester. Then a means was found to incorporate four engines in the general Manchester design, and the result was the Lancaster. Four Merlin or Hercules engines give it a top speed of 300 miles an hour. The increased horsepower enables no less than eight tons of bombs to be carried.
On the 22nd of February, 1942, Bomber Command's fortunes were to change with the appointment of Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Harris as its head and the introduction of a superlative aircraft, the de Havilland Mosquito, affectionately known as the Wooden Wonder. On the night of the 30th of May, Harris underlined his new philosophy when he unleashed the first thousand bomber raid on Cologne. The 1,046 aircraft dispatched, 40 failed to return. But within four hours of that historic raid, 105 bomber squadron was flying the first Mosquito raid in a dawn attack on the stricken city. In the Middle East, one of the stories of World War II unfolded in 1941. The defense of the tiny island of Malta. When the Italians attacked, the island had no air defense at all to speak of except for four sea gladiators, which the officer commanding had ordered to be assembled from their packing cases. They were in fact spares to the fleet air arm. One aircraft was lost almost immediately, and the remaining three were later named Faith, Hope, and Charity. This tiny band of gladiators somehow deterred some 200 Italian aircraft until a squadron of hurricanes finally arrived. Generally, things weren't going too well for Britain, with the fall of Tobruk in North Africa and the fall of Greece and Crete in the middle of 1941. But Sunday the 7th of December was the day of infamy that was to drastically change the direction of the war. Japan attacked the American fleet at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii without warning. 2,403 Americans were killed and 1,178 were wounded. Japan declared war on the USA and the British Commonwealth. Within a week, Germany and Italy both declared war on the United States and unleashed not only the anger of America, but its vast armory of both men and material. In North Africa, Germany's brilliant campaigner, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, had managed to sweep across the continent with his infamous Africa Corps. The RAF, under Air Marshal Tedder, could field 1,200 serviceable frontline aircraft, who were against 690 aircraft of the Axis powers. Opposing Rommel was an equally determined new British commander, General Bernard Montgomery, who systematically got his troops ready for his great counter-offensive at El Alamein. Rommel had told his troops that he was ready to advance on Cairo. General Alexander, Admiral Harwood, and Air Marshal Tedder planned El Alamein together. It was to be one of the first real joint operations of the war. In the desert, Montgomery and Air Vice Marshal Cunningham worked very closely together. Preparations began. of the 30th of October 1942, the Battle of El Alamein began with a massive gun barrage. <laughs> Montgomery's tactic was to persuade the enemy that his main attack was to be south when in fact it was to be north of the line. 
The RAF's tasks were to prevent the enemy aircraft from penetrating the deception, prevent enemy air support, and to give Montgomery's troops complete air support in their main assault. Hurricane 2 Cs attacked troop concentrations and transport, while Hurricane 2 Ds looked after the tanks. Wellington squadrons took on the bombing. Daylight raids were joined by Baltimore's, Boston's, and Mitchell's. This pattern was continued for three days and nights. The final phase of the attack, Operation Supercharge, began on the 2nd of November. Tedder unleashed all his tactical support squadrons. Anti-tank fighters and light bombers achieved massive damage among the enemy vehicles. 30,000 enemy troops and vast quantities of war material were captured by the 8th Army. This included over 1,000 enemy aircraft. This is the BBC Home and Forces program. This is Bruce Belfridge. Here's some excellent news which has come during the past hour in the form of a communique from GHQ Cairo. It says, the Axis forces in the Western Desert, after 12 days and nights of ceaseless attacks by our land and air forces, are now in full retreat. Battle shown and plenty more where that came. In Russia, by the beginning of 1943, the Soviet winter had helped to decimate Germany's Sixth Army when on the 10th of January, General Paulus was given a surrender ultimatum in Stalingrad, which he refused. Now a field marshal, Paulus was a prisoner of war. He surrendered at the Univermag department store on the 31st of January, 1943. By the 2nd of February, the rest of his Sixth Army had capitulated, including 24 German generals. Stalingrad was the turning point for Germany in the Second World War. The final phase of the Tunisian campaign in North Africa began at the end of March in 1943. The Allied strategy was to use the 8th Army to the east, while the bulk of the huge Allied forces were to squeeze the Axis powers out of North Africa to pave the way for the invasion of Europe. While the bulk of the Allied armor carried out a wide flanking movement to the south of Meret, three squadrons of Kitty Hawk fighter bombers attacked the German anti-tank gun screen while Hurricanes dealt with anything that moved. During the following week, the enemy managed to hold on to a number of airfields. But by the 1st of May, the Allies had secured an area of 100 miles by 50 in the extreme north of Tunisia. During the next fortnight, the full might of the Desert Air Force was thrown against the enemy. Enemy shipping trying to bring in supplies were decimated by the RAF. Within two days, the Allies were moving in on Tunis itself. The Germans tried to evacuate their troops by sea, and the Luftwaffe tried to bring in fuel by air. But the RAF Kitty Hawk pilots were there waiting for them. On the 7th of May, the British 7th Armoured Division rolled into Tunis. By the 13th, it was all over. Many times during the war, tribute has been paid by neutral observers to the accuracy of British bombers. 
Here in Tunis, which had been visited so many times, the truth of those statements became visible to the eye. As we fly over the main aerodrome, the bomb damage is clearly visible amongst wrecked enemy aircraft. Nearby, however, houses are intact. Row after row of buildings stand untouched in the town. Then we come to the docks. Here, nothing but devastation remains. To the bomber boys out there, we are indeed grateful. For not only have they contributed much to the winning of the Battle of Tunis, but they have also confirmed the fairness of our way of life. A quarter of a million Germans and Italians had been killed or captured, and the Allies had thrown Hitler's war machine into the Mediterranean at last. Sergeant Cohen and his henchmen walk up to be congratulated by their AOC, Sir Arthur Cunningham, at his villa in Hammamay. These three men, crew of a swordfish belonging to the Air Sea Rescue Service, were on a routine mission seeking two missing pilots. Due to a fault in their compass and lack of petrol, they landed on an island, which they realized could not be Malta. Not long afterwards, to their astonishment, a bemedaled Italian came up and asked them if they'd be kind enough to accept the surrender of himself, his island, and all under his command. They accepted. The Italian was the military commander of the island, and the island was Lampedusa. Tunis had paved the way for the invasion of Sicily and Italy. By March 1943 in Europe, the Battle of the Ruhr started with an attack by 442 aircraft on Essen, led by eight oboe-equipped mosquitoes, whose job it was to go ahead of the main bomber force and light up the target with flares. Another 22 mosquitoes went in and lit up the Krupp's works. The main force of Lancasters, Halifaxes, Stirlings and Wellingtons completed the attack in 20 minutes with a loss of 14 aircraft. Probably the most famous set-piece attack was made by a mere 19 Lancasters on the 26th of May. This was the dam's raid led by Wing Commander Guy Gibson at very low level at night. His targets were the Myrna, Ada and Sorpe dams, which controlled the level of the River Ruhr which provided hydroelectric power for much of the area. I first started in my own garden using the family wash tub and firing little balls that size out of the catapults and found that they would jump off the surface of the water. The idea developed into Barnes Wallace's famous bouncing bomb, which had a very shaky start as the casing on his mines disintegrated when dropped from 150 feet and the bomb release mechanism proved very unreliable. Flying huge Lancasters at night at such low level in formation required very special training for Gibson's hand-picked crews. It also required a special bomb site and lamps whose beams converged on the water at exactly 60 feet. Operation Chastise went ahead on schedule but 617 Squadron encountered terrible navigational problems at such low level. Off course, they ran into heavy flak, but eventually they found the Myrna Dam. The fourth bomb eventually did the trick, and the Myrna Dam was breached, unleashing great torrents of water in the valleys below. Overall, 1943 was very successful for bomber command over Europe with the mass bombing of all Germany's major cities, including Berlin. Sicily was invaded later in that year, but a major plan was being hatched for 1944, the invasion of Normandy in northern France, codenamed Overlord, which was to be the greatest amphibious military undertaking in history. In the weeks before d -Day, Part of the air attack was switched to targets in direct support of the impending landing. There were three main categories. Coastal batteries, which threatened our seaborne armies. Radar stations, which would give warning of the approaching armada. And enemy airfields, in which you could operate in the battle area at closer range than our own fighters based in England. These attacks still had to be spread to give no indication of the landing area. Tactical bombers, with the help of British and American heavies, dealt with the batteries and airports. 
while fighters with bombs and rockets took on the radar station. At least 11 batteries in the vital area were destroyed before D-Day. Every radar station between Barfleur and La Havre was dead, except one. And that only worked in timid spasm. The major role of the Allied Air Forces in preparing the invasion of Europe was finished. Fighters swarmed over the beaches and shipping lanes, but the air preparation had been so thorough that enemy air interference was negligible. Other fighters, armed with cannon and rockets, gave any German troops rash enough to expose a taste of the treatment they soon learned to dread. More convoys slipping down the coast to supplement the battered land communications were cannoned, rocketed and torpedoed by coastal bow fighters. Liberators patrolled continuously on the watch for U-boats. When D-Day came, the German Navy stayed at home. To obtain the closest liaison between our armor and the air, a specially converted tank carrying signal equipment and an RAF officer advanced with our columns. When our troops met a tough position, this tank could call up the pilots of typhoons waiting overhead and direct them down by visual observation onto their targets. In this way, German tanks and 88 millimeter guns were often knocked out within a few minutes of making their presence known. The Hun knew no respite. At Caen, at Como, and twice during the advance from Caen to Falaise, the heavies came. In North Africa, fortresses and liberators had been used in tactical support of the armies, but it was something new for our Lancasters and Halifaxes to appear on the battle. The organization and tactics of Bomber Command were designed for bombing industrial areas by night. Now, they were called upon to do pinpoint bombing largely by day. Dunkirk was avenged. The greatest German army in the West was shattered. Fleeing remnants and worse to come. The bridges over the Seine were down. Every attempt to collect barges or build pontoons had been dealt with by typhoons and mustangs. The conglomeration of men and transport collected on the western bank of the river opposite Rouen. Then the medium bombers struck. The rest of equipment on foot in farm carts the survivors of the German 7th Army struggled back towards the fatherland. Our armies pressed forward close behind them, eager to join in the last great battle on the frontiers of Germany. The air plan was paying dividends. At the end of 1943, Pienemunde on the Baltic coast was to achieve some significance. It was the home of a new and terrifying weapon, the Fiesler pilotless flying bomb, or doodlebug. These pulse jet aircraft were launched from ski ramps. They could cruise at some 360 miles an hour with enough range to hit London, and they had an 1,870 pound warhead. Although Pinamundo was heavily attacked from as early as August 1943, by June 1944, when the first real doodlebug raids were aimed at England, the Germans managed to prefabricate new ramps that were much more difficult to destroy. The B-1s flew at about 3,000 feet, so they were a difficult target for the ground gunners. And many of Britain's fighters were simply too slow to catch the flying bombs. But new types of aircraft came into combat service at that time. The Gloucester Meteor, which was Britain's first jet fighter to enter service. 
its engines have been painstakingly pioneered by Frank Whittle, who had the idea of a jet engine back in 1926. Between June 1944 and March 1945, some 1,847 V1s were destroyed by the RAF. 1,866 were shot down by anti-aircraft fire, 232 struck balloon cables, and the Navy shot down 12 of them. In all, only about a quarter of Germany's doodlebugs ever reached their targets. Wienermunde was also famous for spawning an even more sinister weapon which was to become the basis for all modern rocketry. It was the V2, retaliation weapon number two. This was a long-range ballistic missile with a one-ton bomb load and went ten times as fast as the V1. After many mishaps, it wasn't until 1942 that the first successful launch was made. The V-2 had 55,125 pounds of thrust and would cover 60 miles in a mere four minutes. There was no answer for the V-2. It was only because the Allies were marching through Europe towards the ultimate goal, the German capital, that the German rockets had little effect on the outcome of the conflict. An airplane, 300 English are fleeing from Westen. One o'clock, and an army began to drop from the skies. The battle for the Rhine crossings was on. German reaction had been quick. The airborne troops seized their objective, dug in, and waited. Over the radio, they got word from the ground forces battling northwards to reach them. In filthy weather and in heavy slack, supply planes dropped urgently needed ammunition and supplies. Parachutes went astray, but thanks to the pilots, many found their mark. The Germans turned on the heat. Mobile guns, tanks, flamethrowers. They had contained, now they began to compress. For ten days and nights, the men of Arnhem held on. Held on until they were compressed into an area only a mile square. The Germans closed in for the kill. They had done all they could, so singly in little groups of twos and threes they pulled out across the river. They pulled out and left the field of Arnhem to the enemy. Arnhem was one of the last successes of the Third Reich. In the Far East, the Allies captured Mandalay and Rangoon from the Japanese.
Germany's oil production was conveniently placed in Ploesti, Silesia, and in the Ruhr. In 1944, the Americans and the RAF belatedly decimated the German source of its fuel and all but stopped production of aviation fuel altogether. In spite of the introduction of the ME-262, the Luftwaffe was all but wiped out through lack of fuel and newly trained pilots. Targets for bomber command were the German cities. In February 1945, Dresden was subjected to a massive air attack when over 3,000 tons of bombs were dropped by 773 Lancasters and 311 B-17s. A firestorm raged over the city which burned for seven days and eight nights. The German cities were reduced to hollow shells. On February the 2nd, 1945, Lancaster's Bomber Command attacked the midget submarine fence at Putushafen, dropping 12,000 pound bombs. Bombing was carried out in clear weather from between 12,700 and 14,000 feet on this small target, and many direct hits were scored. February 23, a night attack was carried out by 362 Lancasters and 13 Mosquitoes on the important communications and industrial center of Pforzheim in the Upper Rhineland. There was considerable fighter activity, but bombing was highly concentrated. An examination of this target has proved this was one of the most accurate attacks ever made by Bomber Command. On March 14, Lancaster's Bomber Command attacked the railway viaduct at Bielefeld, using the 22,000-pound bomb for the first time. The arrow will point to the spot where the bomb will strike. There is the spot. There is the crater, and there is the explosion. of a plan for bottling up the German armies in the Ruhr. These pictures taken immediately after the attack show six spans destroyed and severe damage to the embankment leading to the viaduct. On March 16, the railway and industrial centre of Würzburg was the object of a night attack by Bomber Command. The results were excellent and great devastation was caused by fire. Only 212 Lancasters were used in this operation which is a good example of the increased striking power and accuracy of Bomber Command attacks at this time. On March 19, the viaduct at Arnsberg was attacked by Lancaster's of Bomber Command using six 22,000-pound bombs. This viaduct was one of the three main ways of escape out of the Ruhr left to the Germans. And so the attack was clearly related to that carried out on March 14 at Bielefeld. war goes on, the Royal Air Force is the toast not only of the British Empire, 
but of the whole democratic world. For never in all history have so few men rendered such great service to so many. On March 19, the viaduct at Arnsberg was attacked by Lancaster's of Bomber Command using six 22,000 pound bombs. This viaduct was one of the three main ways of escape out of the Ruhr left to the Germans. And so the attack was clearly related to that carried out on March 14 at Bielefeld. pictures taken after the attack show that two spans of this viaduct were smashed and a direct hit was scored on the mouth of the tunnel into which the railway runs at one end. On April 7, 15 Lancasters of Bomber Command attacked a ship at Moiden, which the Germans were preparing to sink in order to block the approaches to the port. 12,000 pound bombs were used and the attack was completely successful. Two attacks on Hamburg were carried out simultaneously by Bomber Command, one on the submarine pens and the second on oil installations. Five penetrations of the submarine pens were obtained and very severe damage was done to the oil installations. Nearly a thousand aircraft of Bomber Command, escorted by Mustangs and Spitfires of Fighter Command, made a heavy and concentrated attack on the naval base and fortress island of Heligoland, whose guns guarded the approaches to Hamburg and Bremen. An airfield on the island of Duna, three quarters of a mile away, was also attacked and saturated with bombs. attacks, every gun but one was put out of action. And on the following day, a small force of 19 bombers made a further attack with 12,000 and 22,000 pound bombs, and this one gun was then effectively silenced. On April 25, 1945, Bomber Command carried out its last heavy attack on the war on Berchtesgaard, Hitler's retreat in Bavaria.
three targets were Hitler's chalet, the SS Barracks and Defense Control Center, and the famous Eagle's Nest. In spite of strong defenses, direct hits were observed on the chalet. Bombing was very concentrated in the whole target area, with smoke rising to 10,000 feet, and severe damage was done to all the targets. The battle for Berlin began on Saturday, the 21st of April, 1945. Marshal Zukov, the general who never lost a battle, entered the suburbs of Berlin. The next day, the Russians captured the Weizensee district, and Hitler decided that he must stay in Berlin against all the odds. By April the 26th, the Soviets had ringed Berlin, while American and Russian troops finally linked up on the Elbe River to the west of the German capital. At 3.30 on the afternoon of the 30th, Hitler and his new wife committed suicide in the Führer bunker beneath the chancellery and were then cremated in the garden while the Russian artillery bombarded the building with the advancing infantry only two blocks away. Goebbels and his family suffered a similar fate the next day. The Nazi regime had nothing left with the capital of Germany reduced to rubble. Hitler's chancellery was destroyed. Germany surrendered on May the 8th, 1945. Hitler was dead. The Third Reich was no more. On August the 6th, 1945, the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, an explosion which changed the course of world history. With the Japanese surrender on August the 14th, the second world conflict in the 20th century was over. American warships entered Tokyo Bay the greatest war the world had ever known became history. At least 60 million people had died. By the end of the Second World War, the Royal Air Force had entered the jet age with the meteor and the vampire. The next target was to be the sound barrier. It was also reasoned that Britain should have its own atomic bomb or nuclear deterrent as the Western world was already witnessing the beginning of a Cold War with its old ally, Russia. All hopes that Europe would experience a lasting peace were shattered on the 24th of June, 1948, when the Soviet Union finally brought all surface communication into a divided Berlin to a grinding halt. This was against all international agreements, which had cut Germany into four sectors or zones, British, American, Russian, and French. Berlin was divided into four equivalent sectors. They also guaranteed certain lines of communication between western sectors of the city across the Soviet zone of Germany. The West had proposed that Germany should become an integrated member of a European community in time. But Russia viewed a united Germany as a threat to its security, and a western enclave situated bang in the middle of the Soviet zone was a constant reminder to those living under the Soviet regime that the West offered a very different way of life. War with Russia was unthinkable, but the West's Berlin garrisons had to be supplied. The alternative was that Russia would swallow up Berlin, which was equally unthinkable. So began the biggest airlift of supplies the world has ever seen. Night and day, week after week, it was a case of more planes, more food, 
more raw materials, shipped without pause from eight different airfields in the western zone. Month after month, the tempo of flights was stepped up, and by Christmas, American and British planes had made 100,000 trips and carried a total of 730,000 tons into Berlin. Even cars were transported, but coal, equally as vital to Berlin as bread, was the greatest load of all. Over one million tons have now been flown in. Hundreds of planes of all types and sizes, military and civil, were pressed into service. The RAF York loads nine tons. The Halifax, over six tons. The Viking, over three tons. RAF Dakota, three tons. The Civil Tudor, eight tons. And what the Berliners call the Grosser Tudor, ten tons. As an additional boost to the airlift, the RAF introduced its Hastings, each carrying over nine tons. At the three airports in Berlin, Gatto, Tempelhof, and Tegel, Aircraft were landing or taking off every 90 seconds. Many notabilities visited Berlin to see the workings of this magnificent achievement and to praise the great work of the British and American ground and air personnel. Chief of the Air Staff, Lord Tedder. And the Foreign Secretary, Mr. Bevin, whose diplomacy was much aided by the success of the airlift. He added his tribute when he visited Berlin on the eve of the lifting of the blockade in May 1949. For ten whole months, a ceaseless stream of Allied aircraft landed in Berlin, where Germans, supervised by British Army personnel, eagerly unloaded the vital supply. Air crews of the RAF and Commonwealth crews from Australia, New Zealand and South Africa, together with their British charter colleagues, all of them played their part with the United States Air Force in maintaining this non-stop operation. The blockade of Berlin was finally lifted on the 12th of May, 1949. For some 30 years, there had been considerable communist activity in Malaya. The country was well suited to guerrilla activity with a central backbone of mountains rising to over 7,000 feet and millions of square miles of thick jungle. By 1948, the Malayan Communist Party had prepared a three-pronged program of subversion. The first stage was to terrorize the rural areas, the second to establish local administrations, and the third was to declare Malaya a communist republic. The counter-strategy was to harass the terrorists in their jungle hideouts using the army, assisted by the RAF in a number of roles. Reconnaissance, offensive air action, and air transport support, which included supply dropping, troop lifting, and the evacuation of casualties. Dropping supplies was found to be hazardous, rain offered very few clearings for the Dakotas. Most were only holes in the jungle canopy of some 20 yards across. On the fighter front, 1953 saw the introduction of the vampire, which proved well suited to the Malayan environment. Back in London on the 2nd of June, 1953, the supreme head of the armed forces was being crowned Queen Elizabeth II. But there were other memorable events which deserve their place in the record of royal occasions of 1953. The Royal Air Force mustered a vast array of men and aircraft for its coronation review at Odium Airfield in Hampshire. The Queen was accompanied by her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, in his uniform as Marshal of the Royal Air Force. She was attended by the Secretary of State for Air, Lord Delisle and Dudley. It was the first royal review of the RAF since King George V's Silver Jubilee. Though a few of the men present were on parade for inspection by the Queen's grandfather in 1935, 
The spirit and the bearing were the same. The review of 1,100 officers, airmen, and airwomen occupied the morning, and during a pause for luncheon, 300 or more aircraft representing all RAF command were made ready for royal inspection. This static display was most impressive. In order to view the machines massed in such quantity and variety, Her Majesty and the Duke entered their car to drive along the line. At several points, the Queen stopped to talk with officers in command of squadron and to make a closer scrutiny of various aspects of this unique display. It was a five-mile tour that lasted a full hour. Then they entered their car again to drive back to the saluting base. For the Queen, delighted as she was by all she had seen, there was still the thrill of the great fly pass to come. A Sycamore helicopter led the actual parade, which had called for the biggest and the most intricate RAF organization that had ever been. From dozens of stations all over the country, aircraft of all commands, these are training command varsities, converged on Odium, and one can well imagine the split-second timing that was necessary. Now troop-carrying Valettas fly over. As squadron after squadron arrived, the speed of the fly past mounted. Meteors now are fighter command. followed by the famous Canberra bomber. And Sabre jets with their swept back wings, manned by pilots of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Then came Swifts, with which the RAF was about to be equipped. latest in jet bombers, the Victor was there, making its first public appearance, an aircraft of strange and menacing design. And Lincoln's of Bomber Command. The new Lincoln bombers were introduced into the Malayan conflict in the reconnaissance role in 1953. More significant in April 1950, was the arrival of the RAF's first operational helicopters, the three Westland Dragonflies of the casualty evacuation flight. Before this, the venerable Oster was used wherever possible to evacuate casualties. Now it had a new role, which was to lead the Dragonflies to their targets. nineteen fifty five saw the introduction of the larger Westland whirlwind which was disappointing as a troop carrier. by nineteen fifty six the terrorists were beginning to surrender the emergency officially ended in july nineteen sixty for the mopping up operation the RAF brought in the Hawker Hunter and the meteors were replaced by Gloucester javelins a new emergency began in 1962 with rebellions in the British Protectorate of Borneo. This time, the RAF was well prepared. By the end of the 40s, it was clear to the Western world that the Soviet Union was in no mood for peace. So on the 4th of April, 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was signed, which was to come into effect on the 24th of August. Now the world was divided by two huge security pacts. NATO for the West, and the Warsaw Pact, which encompassed most of the communist world led by the Soviet Union. It was clear that the RAF had to keep up with any threat from the communist bloc. The atomic age had arrived. Britain had to have an atomic deterrent and a bomber force to deliver it. The Canberra had proved to be an effective bomber, but couldn't carry atomic bombs. Britain's designers had been hard at work developing a nuclear bomb and a V-force of bombers to deliver it into the Soviet heartland. 
The first of the V-bombers arrived at Gaydon early in 1955. It was the Vickers Valiant, together with the Blue Danube plutonium bomb. The first Balcom B Mark I squadron was formed at RAF Waddington in May 1957, and two Victor squadrons were formed in 1958 at Cottesmore. During the same year, Britain tested her nuclear deterrent near Malden Island. A Valiant, based at Christmas Island, successfully dropped Britain's first megaton hydrogen bomb, and the meteorological effects were monitored by Roy Chadwick's last masterpiece, the Avro Shackleton. By 1959, the RAF recognized that any bomber force had a very short time to get into the air should the Soviet bloc launch ballistic missiles against Europe. That time was a mere three minutes. Conventional starts meant that the V bombers took four minutes. So a program was introduced that meant all four engines could be started together. This reduced the reaction time to two minutes. Bomber Command also instigated low-level attacks by its aircraft to get under enemy radar. There was another question. What would happen if all major airfields were wiped out in a first attack, and what aircraft could be used for a second strike? There was a need for a low-level strike-attacking bomber with short field operating performance. TSR-2 was that aircraft. Between 1959 and 1964, budgets were being savagely cut, and with the election of a Labour government in 1964, the TSR-2 project was relegated to the scrap heap. The NATO early warning radar station at Filingdales was put under RAF command. It could give four minutes warning of even a missile attack. American Thor missiles were lent to the RAF to augment Britain's nuclear power. Meanwhile, Blue Steel was developed. It was dropped from a V-bomber and had a range of 100 miles. Then Britain was promised the American Skybolt with a range of 1,000 miles, but Skybolt was cancelled by the United States. Instead, Britain was offered Polaris. So after 12 years, Britain's deterrent was handed over to the Royal Navy. In-flight refueling, had long been a requirement in the RAF. During the early 60s, a number of victors were converted to that role. In June 1961, four of them helped a Vulcan fly from Scampton in Lincolnshire to Sydney non-stop. As far back as 1957, politicians were convinced that the future of warfare would depend on surface-to-air missiles so that by 1965, the RAF had lost some 60 frontline fighters. One fighter that did survive was the English Electric Lightning. The Lightning was the RAF's first supersonic fighter with speeds over Mach 2 in level flight and a highly sophisticated radar system that could lock itself onto its target and bring the pilot into firing range. By 1967, all Fighter Command frontline aircraft were equipped with in-flight refueling probes. And by the end of 1969, Lightnings were being flown to the Far East with only one ground refueling stop on the way. Well, the left hand is fast, we're gone now. In 1964, yet another British aircraft was abandoned. It was the P-1154 V-Stoll fighter from Hawkers. The government of the day decided on the American McDonnell Phantom, which entered squadron service in 1969. But the threat from Russia meant that Britain needed an airborne early warning system. The Shackleton filled this role. It also pioneered a system to control the fighters and guide them onto their targets. By the late 60s, the RAF was looking for a replacement for the Shackleton. The answer came from Hawker Siddeley in the form of Nimrod, which was basically a radical development of the Comet, which was used to great effect in Transport Command. Nimrod was introduced into the service in the latter part of 1970. 
Nimrod. In biblical times, Nimrod was a mighty hunter. It's a fitting name today for the most advanced maritime aeroplane in the world. A submarine hunter killer and maritime reconnaissance aircraft, the Nimrod is replacing the Shackleton in the Royal Air Force Strike Command. The nerve center of this extremely sophisticated aircraft is not the flight deck, but the central operations room. A high degree of automation and computing is used for its sensor and navigational systems. Digital computing system on. on. Its high speed enables Nimrod to arrive at a search area in less than half the time required by a Shackleton. Therefore, submarine escape time is reduced and the area to be searched is cut down. Check now from Sonic's coordinator, we're standing by for the drop. Roger, nine miles. Roger. ECM racket classified as possible submarine radar. Day and night, in all weathers, from an operational height of more than 30,000 feet, Nimrod can detect, identify and locate surface or submerged vessels. Because of financial restrictions, there were only four squadrons with six aircraft apiece, so the Shackleton still survived in tandem. The strike attack role was taken over by the Blackburn Buccaneer, which was another aircraft that was to stand the test of time. From the end of the Second War, the RAF had to base a large proportion of its forces in Germany to protect Europe from the Soviet threat. In the early 70s, Germany's NATO bases saw a number of improvements with the arrival of the Phantom FGR Mark IIs, which replaced the aging Canberras. They also saw the introduction of the Harrier v stahl aircraft. Number 25, SAM Squadron, was deployed to Germany equipped with the Bloodhound Mark II surface-to-air missile. Later in the 70s, Jaguars replaced Phantoms of number 14, 17 and 31 squadrons, and in 1977 they replaced the Lightnings of 19 and 92 squadrons. Although Britain lost many of its dependents and bases in the 70s, Cyprus was still important to the RAF, with a mighty force. A force designed to serve, to watch and ward. Daily a multitude of different duties. Yet here the means to supply, survey, refuel, reconnoiter, strike, intercept or transport. Hundreds of tons of aircraft and many different types. Countless missions, roles, tasks, and takeoffs. then is a service, a service that must be vigilant, mobile, and above all else, airborne. Get on. Get on. Study should be late. Wait on. But for every one man in the sky, there are some 40 on the ground, keeping him there. These people, performing their varied duties, form the very backbone of the entire organization, blending their respective skills to shape a giant team. A team in which every player is vital and every day brings a fresh crop of challenges. Airspace near Britain also had to be defended around the clock 365 days and nights a year. One unidentified aircraft coming away North Cape at the moment. And that Southern QRA. QRA. Quick reaction alert. Five times a week, on average, an RAF fighter is scrambled on a quick reaction alert. Mission, to intercept and escort any unidentified aircraft which threatens our airspace. Zero three, cockpit readiness. Scramble. 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 Zero three, scrambling. Mm -hmm.
to Syracuse. I'm looking over on radar. Nothing yet. Starboard 360. Target 015 at 30,000. Zero 03, Roger. From the 60s, the RAF were perfecting yet another role. Flying combat troops and their equipment into a theater of operations and then providing them with all forms of air support needed to finish the job. This is the primary task of Air Support Command. Getting them there is the job of the strategic force. Local air support is supplied by the tactical element. Using its VC-10s, Britannias and Belfast, aircraft normally kept busy on routine flights overseas, the Air Force is always ready to implement contingency plans at very short notice and rush troops to trouble spots anywhere in the world. Well, that's the strategic role. Ground forces of the Army successfully deployed into the theater of operations. But a strategic airlift of this magnitude can only conveniently be deployed into the larger airfields, which normally are to be found well to the rear of the actual fighting. Therefore, it's the job of the heavy tactical aircraft, such as the Hercules, to uplift the troops, their weapons and supplies further forward to as near the battle zone as is practicable. Almost certainly, this will involve using unsophisticated and even unprepared landing strips as airheads. The Hercules aircraft was designed to operate on the sort of rough terrain in which many of these forward landing strips are likely to be found. Once these aircraft have reached their forward landing limits, Troops and materials can be parachuted or ferried by helicopter closer to the front line. On the 2nd of April, 1982, Argentinian forces landed on the British protectorate of the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic. The Argentine claimed the islands as their own, never thinking that Britain, some 8,000 miles away, would call its bluff. The Falklands conflict was the biggest test for the RAF since the Second World War. The first of the South Atlantic task force left Portsmouth in southern England on the 5th of April, 1982. The RAF's roles were strike, surveillance support, and SAR operations using Falcons, which were actually due for the scrap heap, Harriers, Nimrods, Hercules, VC-10s, Victors, and Sea King helicopters to ensure that the task force ran the Argentinians out of the Falklands. One of the most audacious raids ever mounted in the history of aviation began at 11 p.m. on the night of the 30th of April when two Vulcans took off from the Ascension Islands accompanied by two Victor tankers and headed for Fort Stanley Airfield on the Falkland Islands. One of the Vulcans failed to pressurize, so the second continued on its 16-hour flight to the target. Operation Black Buck was well underway. After its fifth airborne refueling, the Vulcan dropped 250 feet above the ocean for the last 300 miles. Then it pulled up to 10,000 feet before dropping 21 1,000-pound bombs bang on the runway at Fort Stanley. But it was the Harriers of both the Navy and the RAF that received their baptism of fire during that war. The RAF had flown their GR3s from England via the Ascension Islands to the Falklands, refueling in the air as they went. 
On May the 1st, a Navy Sea Harrier, flown by an RAF officer, like Lieutenant Paul Barton, shot down an Argentine Mirage with his Sidewinder missile. Harrier was at war, and it destroyed 20 enemy aircraft, while nine Harriers were down, none by Argentine aircraft. Out to sea, the greatest danger was from the French-made Super Etendard carrying the sea-skimming Exocet missile. One got through and decimated the Atlantic conveyor. Operation Corporate came to its conclusion with the surrender of the Argentinian forces on the 14th of June, 1982. The RAF, yet again, proved that air support is absolutely essential in any modern war, however far away you are from home. As the Falklands conflict came to an end, the RAF received the first of its Panavia tornadoes, the GR Mark I. This multi-role combat aircraft was an international project between Germany, Belgium, Canada, the Netherlands, Italy, and Great Britain. It has variable geometry wings, it's fitted with terrain-following radar, which means that it can fly at ultra-low level and very high speed in any weather, day or night. And it hits its target right on the button. Tornado, just as the Phantom before it, had to protect Britain's shores 24 hours a day. But in the modern world, the backup for the pilots has had to become more and more sophisticated. Today's airborne battles will be fought at or near supersonic speeds. The pilots and navigators that fly these aircraft depend on the experience and expertise of their fighter controllers to guide them safely and successfully onto their targets. Please acknowledged. Return to cap vector 250. These are the RAF's battle managers. The radar information that flows into this operations room gives a picture of the position of every civilian and military aircraft in the sector. This information comes in first to these recognition officers. When you do get an unidentified track, you can never be totally sure what the aircraft is going to do next. Their job is to know the identity of every aircraft that comes into their area from its radar response, known as a track. Any aircraft that cannot be identified and does not respond to interrogation they pass up the line to their boss, a track production officer, for a wider assessment. Corporal, can you get the AW buff on them, please? We've got uh, AW I'd never be able to find another job like this one. You've got to be decisive. It's not a job everyone's capable of. If the aircraft still remains unidentified, the information must be passed on up to the master controller. It's down to him, then, to decide on a course of action. He's the kingpin. He's the battle manager up to date, will you? I run the battle. I decide what action to take and when. Down here in the operations room, we've got a complete and up-to-date picture of all the activity in the United Kingdom Air Defense Network. It's 100% accurate to the second. If the master controller decides to intercept, he'll pass the order down to his fighter allocator, who rapidly assess the status of the aircraft available to him to combat the threat. The fighter cab Foxtrot Lima for Bulma Fighter Stud. One nine seven. Scramble, scramble, scramble. 
It's like playing three-dimensional chess with pieces moving at speeds of up to 500 miles an hour. The fighter allocator will deploy what aircraft he considers necessary for the mission, then hand over control to one of his intercept controllers. It's they who will finally guide the fighters onto their targets. One and two on channel. Hello, I've got uh, Magic Sipsi calling. He would like a brief for his tasking. The recognition officers are directly responsible to their track production officer. They monitor all the track data coming in from several recognition officers. Proceed to area UK 33. It's my job to put the whole picture together. Low flight level 200. Speed above. I have to ensure that accurate and up-to-date information is coming in at all times. Also, that there's no duplication of data or gaps in the radar coverage. If I do detect a gap, it's my job to fill it and fast, using airborne early warning aircraft, air defense capable ships, or by relocating a mobile radar unit. You copy, over. These radar units are commanded by a track production officer who's responsible for the safety and administration of the convoy as well as ensuring that the best possible radar picture is provided for the area. You really have to be able to think well ahead and manage both the technical and the operational side of the radar. Soon after I arrived at RAF Bulma, I met some of the pilots on 202 Search and Rescue Squadron. They share the same station as us. They persuaded me to help them out occasionally at weekends to give them some valuable practice winching me out of the North Sea. The track production officer relays all the relevant data from the recognition side through to the master controller. This is the hot seat, right at the heart of things. During exercises of war, I run the short-term battle plan. The fighter allocator, probably a flight lieutenant, is responsible for assigning controllers their targets. In peacetime, he coordinates the flying program for the fighter squadrons in his sector. Once the fighter allocator has chosen his aircraft and made contact, he hands over control to his intercept controllers. Rooster 2, target port 340. Rooster 1, starboard 1. My task is to direct the intercepting fighters onto the target so that it can be first identified and, if necessary, destroyed. I'm responsible for the safety of both crew and aircraft. In peacetime, I look after something like 40 practice intercepts a month. I work very closely with and rely on my assistants. Two, four, five. Apart from the RAF's fighter intercept ability, heavy reliance for our air defense is put on our Bloodhound surface-to-air, or SAM, missiles. The officer in command of surface-to-air operations is known as the engagement controller. The post will be filled by an officer from the system side of the branch. He's responsible for the missiles, the launchers, the launch control post, and the day-to-day -day management of the section. He works through his control and reporting center, but he's often got to act on his own initiative. In a war, it will be down to his command to fire the missiles. Good look out to the east and the southeast. Fighter controllers have now begun flying duties with the airborne early warning mission groups on the RAF's E3 aircraft. Let's see one changing that Sorry. PD, I see one. Of the 17 man crew, nine will be fighter controllers. TD Link Manager, I, Jim from DRV, established with uh, Boomer and Nita's Head. Heading Four times a year, zero. the RAF takes part in full-scale NATO zero. exercises. Strength two, no squawk. Got that, thank you. The battle manager must keep ahead of the game. Allocator, Razor 1 and 2, to new combat air patrol, Juliet Whiskey Foxtrot. Jay, move Razor 1 and 2 to new combat air patrol, Juliet Whiskey Foxtrot. You've got to think ahead. Get your aircraft airborne before they get you. Heading south at 4,000 feet. Mission intercept, engage. Razor 1 and 2, snap, 030. Two targets, 025-65, heading south. Roger, Razor. 02560. Left right heading 180480. 02040. 02030. Display right heading 180. Targets descending. Contact, keep talking. Targets level 250 feet descend 1000. Hard starboard 
Well, we all know we've got it right. Roger, complete acknowledged. Return to camp vector 250. All these skills were soon to be needed in the Gulf War, and Tornado was to prove itself in combat far sooner than anyone could have imagined, because the Iraqi army invaded Kuwait on the 2nd of August 1990. Saddam Hussein angered the world to such a degree that an international task force was sent into the region to counter the Iraqi aggression after a request from Kuwait. Jaguar was used as a tank buster during the desert conflict. They were based at Al Marak as they were prepared for battle. RAF tornadoes were used in their capacity as long-range bombers to knock out Iraqi airfields and pinpoint targets. The Buccaneer, again due for retirement, also came out of mothballs to lead the tornadoes onto their targets. Out to sea, Harriers arrived in style for their second war in a decade, while Sea Kings were brought in to detect mines in the Gulf itself. They were also on standby in their role as rescue aircraft. On the 17th of January, 1991, Tornadoes took off for their first real sortie into enemy territory with all the most modern equipment on hand. Long hours went by, deep into the night, as the crews waited for the tornadoes to return. Suddenly, at last, flickering lights in the distant dawn. The first formation of tornadoes was safely back. The young British pilots had flown deep into the heart of Iraq to attack military airfields and other targets. Low-level flying to slip under enemy radar, dodging missiles and anti-aircraft flak, catching the Iraqis by surprise in this first encounter of an aerial microchip war. When the pilots had radioed back, mission successful, there was unrestrained joy in the command operations center. And as the air crew wearily left the cramped cockpit of their planes, there were congratulations for the pilots and navigators who had braved the unknown and returned safely to tell about the fear and tension of it all. It's absolutely terrifying. There's no, nowhere for it. You're, you're frightened of failure. You're frightened of dying. Oh, it's everything. You're flying as low as you dare, uh, high enough to get the weapons off, but you, you push it as low as you can over the target. Just get away as fast as you can. Successful though the attack may have been in paralyzing Iraq's air force, albeit temporarily perhaps, the state of readiness is not being relaxed. Ever since the bombing blitz, the Tornado pilots have remained keyed up and ready to go into action. Well, they've come back, they've reported the, uh, the firing of missiles, explosions, lots of ground fire coming from Kuwait. Uh, they've been able to see that from the air. It was obviously a very busy night in Kuwait. Even as Allied pilots waited for their next mission, another chemical attack alarm. Ground crews quickly donning their gas masks once again. But no panic in what has now become a well-drilled task in reaching the safety of the bomb-proof bunkers. Though this time, it was no exercise. Pilots and navigators fully protected in their nuclear, biological and chemical suits arriving for a final briefing. Although the huge task force returned Kuwait to its rightful owners, the Gulf War was a war that nobody really won. But the RAF, as it had done so many times before, did its job with precision and flair. But that flair doesn't just happen. RAF pilot training has always been of the highest caliber, from the tutor to the tiger moth and the mild magister to the more advanced Harvard or Fighter Command during those dark days of the Second World War, to the men and women of the Air Transport Auxiliary who ferried anything, anywhere. 
and then the faithful Anson, used to train Bomber Command's crews to learn at least the rudiments of getting accurately from A to B to drop their lethal loads on the enemy from the Blenheim or the Wellington and later the Lancaster or the Vulcan. Throughout the history of flying, the practitioner has always wanted to show the aircraft to an adoring crowd. In the 30s, it was Northolt or Hendon where the curious mingled to behold the wonders of power and space. From the amphibious to the bomber, even seasoned pilots always watch and wonder at the ingenuity of these craft of the air. But surely, it's the art of the aerobat that will always capture man's imagination. From the string and ceiling wax of the biplane era, to the sleek sophistication of the jet age. The Royal Air Force has always recognized its debt to its shareholders, the great British public, by making sure that they have a chance to witness some of the greatest aviators in the world. In the 50s and 60s, 111 Squadron, the Black Arrows, made their mark in history. less than 16 hunters rolled in unison. Followed by 22 aircraft in a perfect loop. Red Pelicans from the Central Flying School dazzled an international crowd when they joined forces with the Nats that made up a new formation team, the Yellow Jacks. Yellow Nats from Number 4 Flying Training School at RAF Valley changed their name and the colour of their aircraft to become the world famous Red Arrows. As time and technology took over, Strike Command's Hawks replaced the aging Nats, 